The history of Narnia spans across thousands of years, multiple ages, and countless rulers and historical figures. However, in the entire history of Narnia, there is one Narnian whose story is told with more depth and detail than any other. His story spans over several books, and his impact on the world of Narnia lasted for generations. This is the story of the legendary Caspian the 10th. Caspian's story is both rich and broad, and there's a great deal to cover here, but before we do, I want to say thank you to the many Patreon supporters who are supporting this channel. It's because of your generosity and dedication to telling the stories of Narnia that this video is possible, so thank you. Well, there's a great deal to cover here, so let's get started. It's time to leave the Shadowlands behind and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. Caspian X was born in the Narnian year 2290, during the time of the Telmarine reign of Narnia. His ancestor, Caspian I, had established the Telmarine dynasty in Narnia nearly 300 years earlier after invading the country in the year 1998. During the Telmarine conquest, all non-human Narnians had been killed or driven into hiding, and so Caspian was born into a Narnia that was almost entirely a world of men no longer a place filled with talking beasts, fawns, dryads, and the like. Only a few dwarves who could pass as humans secretly remained, and over time, all history of the old Narnia was forgotten, completely dismissed as myth or legend. Shortly after Caspian's birth, his father the king was murdered, and a short time later his mother also died of mysterious circumstances, leaving Caspian an orphan. He was raised in the royal castle by his uncle, Moraz, who took advantage of this guardianship to unofficially seize control of the kingdom in a slow and methodical silent coup, killing or driving out all nobility that was loyal to his brother, giving himself the title of Lord Protector of Narnia, and eventually declaring himself to be Narnia's king. All of this was hidden from Caspian, as Moraz patiently awaited the day that he would himself have a son who could carry on his own bloodline. Caspian spent his childhood under the strict and watchful eye of his uncle, who secretly controlled the education and information that was taught to the young prince, particularly in the subject of Narnian history, which was totally devoid of any mention of the existence of the old Narnia. However, Caspian's dear nursemaid would secretly tell him tales and legends about the creatures in the old days of Narnia. When Miraz learned of this, he quickly had Caspian's nurse removed and was instead placed under the tutelage of a small and very wise old man known as Dr. Cornelius. Cornelius would become a pivotal figure in the life of the future king. Besides teaching him important princely subjects such as history, politics, grammar, and astronomy, Caspian also studied warfaring skills such as sword fighting, archery, horseback riding, and presumably military strategy, all skills that would prove useful later in life. Interestingly enough, however, because of the Telmarine's fear of the sea, Caspian was not officially taught about sailing or navigation. Caspian studied under Cornelius for many years, but as he grew, he never forgot the stories of the old Narnia that were taught to him as a young child. One fateful day during a history lesson, Caspian mentioned these stories to Dr. Cornelius, hopefully asking whether or not they might be true. Cornelius only offered a vague and short response that day, but a few nights later, he was awoken by Dr. Cornelius, who led Caspian to the roof of a high tower under the auspices of an astronomy lesson. On that fateful night, Cornelius revealed the truth, that the old Narnian legends were in fact real, and moreover, that Cornelius himself was actually half dwarf. Many more secret meetings in the tower followed where Cornelius would teach Caspian about the old Narnia and its history. During this time, he implored Caspian to be a better king than his fathers before him, to be a friend to all Narnians. And Caspian was resolved that when Miraz died and he took the throne, he would indeed restore Narnia to its former glory. However, one night, everything changed, as Caspian was quickly awoken by Dr. Cornelius, who informed him that his aunt had just given birth to a son. Miraz had secured his own heir and was now preparing to murder Caspian that very night. Cornelius urged Caspian to flee immediately and sent him off with supplies including the legendary magical horn of Queen Susan. Caspian fled the castle on his trusted steed Destrier and rode for a day and a half to the southern region of Narnia, in the foothills of the great southern mountains that bordered Arkenland. All of this set the stage for what would become a very significant period in Caspian's life. 
During his time in political exile, Caspian not only discovered colonies of old Narnians that had survived the Tumarine occupation in hiding, but more importantly, he rallied an entire army of these old Narnians, who would join him to rise up against Miraz and reclaim Narnia for its rightful citizens. With the help of newfound allies such as Trumpkin the Red Dwarf, Truffle Hunter the Badger, Glenstrom the Centaur, and of course, Reapy Cheap, the leader of the mice, Caspian and his army set up a strategic defensive perimeter at the ancient site of the Stone Table Hill, now known as Aslan's Howl. Eventually, Miraz's army confronted the Narnian army, and the Battle of Aslan's Howl stretched on for several weeks. With morale now becoming near desperation, Caspian and his council decided that, being in their greatest moment of need, it was time to blow Susan's magical horn in the hope that the legends were true and help really would come. Alas, help did not instantly come that day, and Caspian's army suffered even more casualties in yet another skirmish with a Telmarine patrol. With supplies running low, council was held in the main chamber of the Howe. It was there that Nicobric the Dwarf proposed resurrecting and enlisting Jadis the White Witch with the help of his companions, a werewolf and a hag. When a deadly fight broke out between the parties, out of the darkness appeared Peter, Edmund, and their new friend Trumpkin, who rushed to aid the council. It seemed that Susan's horn had worked after all. With the uniting of the new and ancient kings, a new strategy was set to challenge Miraz in a duel that would decide the victor of the battle once and for all. Miraz accepted the challenge, and the duel took place later that day outside Aslan's Howe, with King Peter serving as the Narnian champion and Miraz himself fighting for the Telmarines. Both Peter and Miraz fought fiercely. However, the duel was disrupted when one of Miraz's men stabbed Miraz in the back, killing him. In the confusion, fighting broke out and the Narnians and Telmarines took to arms. This battle would become known as the War of Deliverance. Fortunately, the battle itself was fairly brief and many lives were spared that day as the Narnians quickly overtook the Telmarines. The Telmarines attempted a retreat, but their escape was cut off when Aslan himself, along with Queen Lucy and Queen Susan, awoke the river god and destroyed the bridge of Baruna. And so, on that day, the twelfth day of Greenroof, Narnian year 2303, the Telmarine invasion was officially brought to an end. Caspian was knighted as a knight of the most royal order of the lion, and shortly after the Pevensies returned to their world, Caspian X was crowned as the true king of Narnia, thus marking the beginning of Narnia's sixth age, the Age of Exploration. For the next several years, Caspian set about the work of restoration in Narnia, with the express goal of setting right all the wrongs that had been done by his uncle and his forefathers. He established Narnia as a land of equality where all creatures lived together in peace and harmony, from dwarves to talking beasts, and even the remnant faction of Telmarines. He established treaties with Arkenland and Telmar. He built his own team of trusted advisors and delegated leaders and continued to build up the Narnian army. He even rebuilt the Narnian navy, which had been completely abandoned during the Telmarine conquest, teaching his men the art of seamanship and constructing the first native Narnian ships in generations. During those early years, he demonstrated the strength of the new Narnian military by waging a campaign against the northern giants, who were ultimately so defeated that they even ended up paying tribute to Narnia. Within just three years' time, Caspian had restored peace and order to the Narnian mainland, and he set about on his final task of restoration. You see, on his coronation day, Caspian had sworn an oath to Aslan that once he had established peace in Narnia, he would sail east for a year and a day to find the seven lost lords of Narnia. And so, in Narnia year 2306, Prince Caspian and his crew set sail on the small but legendary ship, the Dawn Treader, which Caspian had built for this very journey. Notable members of his crew included the ship's captain, Drinian, his first mate, Rince, and of course, the king's most trusted advisor, Sir Reapycheep, who had bravely served alongside Caspian during the War of Deliverance. The Dawn Treader launched in 2306 from the island of Caer Paravel and sailed to every known island in the Great Eastern Ocean, including Galma, Terabinthia, the Seven Isles, and finally the Lone Islands. It was on this leg of the journey that Caspian rescued from the sea none other than Queen Lucy and King Edmund Pevensey, along with their cousin Eustace Scrub, who had all been brought back to Narnia by a magical portal in the form of a small framed painting. 
The children joined the crew of the Dawn Treader and sailed with Caspian for the remainder of his journey, during which time they would make their mark on Narnian history, including abolishing slavery on the Lone Islands and reinstating Narnian governance, sailing beyond the bounds of the Great Eastern Ocean into truly uncharted waters, discovering many new islands with strange and powerful features, finding all seven lost lords, meeting the woman who would become Caspian's wife, and finally, reaching the end of the world and the passage to Aslan's country. Three years later, in 2310, Caspian married Ramandu's daughter, becoming a queen who was dearly loved by all the citizens of Narnia. The king and queen served Narnia well over the next decade and a half, and 15 years after their marriage, the queen gave birth to a son who was named Rillian. Sadly, in 2345, tragedy struck the royal family when, during an outing in the northern parts of the kingdom, the queen was bitten and killed by a great and mysterious serpent. Years later, it would be revealed that this serpent was actually a witch known as the Lady of the Green Kirtle. The queen's death was devastating for the entire nation, but it was especially heartbreaking for Caspian, who had loved her deeply for nearly 40 years. To make matters even worse, Prince Rillian disappeared not many weeks later, after setting off to find and kill the serpent that had murdered his mother. The loss of Caspian's two great loves was nearly more than he could bear, and over the next decade, Caspian's health steadily declined. As Caspian's health began to fail him, and with no heir apparent in place, he set off on one final journey to see Aslan face to face once more, and ask him who should take his place as king. Following the rumors that Aslan had been spotted on the island of Terabinthia, Caspian set sail in 2356, headed first toward Terabinthia, and then, if Aslan wasn't to be found there, onward to the east until he would finally see Aslan once again. However, before the king had sailed very far, Aslan did indeed come to Caspian. Whether it was face to face or by a vision, history isn't clear. However, Aslan told Caspian to return to Narnia, where he would find his long lost son. The king had grown very weak during this voyage, nearly to the point of death, and by the time the ship came to port in Caer Paravel, Caspian had to be carried off the ship in a stretcher. He lived just long enough to see his son once again, and after a heartfelt embrace, King Caspian raised his hand to give Tyrion a final blessing. When he had finished, he lay his head back down on his pillow and gave up his final breath. All of this happened in the year 2356. However, Caspian's story does not end there. After being revived by a single drop of blood from Aslan's paw, Caspian awoke to find himself on the mountain of Aslan. What's more, he was transformed from a frail old man into his younger and vibrant self. In the year 2555, Narnia was brought to an end and Caspian joined many other beloved Narnians for the great and final reunion. And while the recorded history of Caspian may end there, his story still continues to this day in the great and true Narnia of Aslan's country. One day, we just may learn more of the story of Caspian X, but for now, we can know that his journey certainly continues further up and further in.